Good evening. It's good to be with you. And we begin this uh, first Wednesday of Advent uh, with evening prayer. And it's found on page 243 in the front section of your hymnal. We'll be reading the, the liturgy and singing uh, the hymns. But I invite you please to stand with me as we begin on page 243. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening. Let your light scatter the darkness. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who led your people Israel by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May his word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful and you love your whole creation. And we, your creatures, glorify you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please turn to hymn number 947.
And we continue on our bulletin uh, with these words from the 80th Psalm. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth. Return to us, O God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the Son of Man you have raised up for yourself. Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. And let us pray. Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend on us that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly host may glorify you forever. Amen. And please be seated. Our first reading is from Job chapter 33. For God does speak, now one way, now another, though no one perceives it, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on people as they slumber in their beds. He may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings to turn them from the wrongdoing and keep them from pride, to preserve them from the pit, their lives from perishing with the sword. Or someone may be chastened on a bed of pain with constant distress in their bones so that their body finds food repulsive and their soul loathes the choicest meal. Their flesh wastes away to nothing and their bones, once hidden, now stick out. They draw near to the pit and their life to the messengers of death. Yet if there is an angel at their side, a messenger, one out of a thousand, sent to tell them how to be upright, and he is gracious to that person and says to God, spare them from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom for them. Let their flesh be renewed like a child's. Let them be restored as in the days of their youth then that person can pray to God and find favor with him. They will see God's face and shout for joy. He will restore them to full well-being. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Please stand again with me for the reading of the gospel, and we'll be singing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, the first three verses after that. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. 
Please be seated. Well, I need to explain a little bit to you. Sometimes when I uh, give titles in advance, it doesn't quite work out the way uh, I scheduled. And this morning, I uh, I spent the morning putting together. Uh, a sermon on this topic, and when I got done with it, I, I realized that uh, that would be a perfect sermon for Christmas Eve. And so I talked to my wife, and she said, well, why don't you preach that one on Christmas Eve then? And I prayed about it, and I thought, I think I will. So the one in a dream, uh, I'm looking forward to Christmas Eve. And uh, But from the same passage, Hebrews chapter 1, uh, I want to roll through some of these scriptures. I was thinking when I came out, uh, before I used to think of lighting the Advent candles, and it brings us one uh, week closer to uh, celebrating the birth of Christ. But to tell you the truth, with all the world events now, I'm starting to think that, uh, and get excited about the fact that it brings us one week closer to the return of Jesus. There are so many things that are starting to be fulfilled in the scriptures in our world. But in Hebrews chapter 1, it, the writer of Hebrews, and he, he's, of course, writing this to the Hebrew people, he gives a glowing, wonderful, beautiful account of who was born to Mary in that manger. And it starts out just like the, 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 the nice liturgy in that evening service. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. By the way, in many ways means uh, many ways, and one of the ways is through dreams. And we'll look at that on Christmas Eve. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, and through whom also he created the world. This means before the world was created, this one born as a baby in, in the manger 
was with God the Father in the beginning. Matter of fact, John chapter 1, the very first words are in the beginning. And it's no mistake that he knew, and so did they, that the very first words in, in uh, Genesis were in the beginning. And he starts the New Testament gospel in the same way that uh, Moses started the Genesis account. But he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. I went back to the Greek just to make sure, because you can have friends and neighbors who say, that's not a right translation, that the word was God. I want to tell you the Greek is the same word all the way through was, 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 which it's was every single time. And if you take out, if you even, if you don't know Greek, now of course they don't like LCMS pastors because they know we're, stu we're trained in Greek and Hebrew. But if you start taking out a Greek New Testament you say, and hand it to them, uh, they kind of get terrified and they leave because they can't read the Greek. They just had someone tell them who does most heresy, false teacher, false teaching, comes from trying to simplify the mysteries of God. In other words, the mystery of this child in Bethlehem is that he is totally human and he is totally God. Rationally, that doesn't make sense, it's a mystery. So people will say, well, he's either man or he's God. But he can't be both. But he is both. John says he was in the beginning. He, replay, he re, repeats that again. And all things were made through him. And without him, this is speaking of Jesus, was not anything made that was made. In other words, before one thing was created in our universe at, in the beginning, Jesus was there. He was with God and he was God. And everything was created through him. Colossians chapter 1 goes on to say this too. It says he, and I'm going to identify just because uh, to help it out when you get these different pronouns and he, speaking of the Father, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. And that alone is such a gorgeous, beautiful thought. He took us out of the domain of darkness and death, and he, all his own doing, brought us out, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He, speaking of the Son, uh, is the image of the invisible God. And these thoughts echo Colossians, Hebrews, and so on. He is the firstborn of all creation. We don't have time for that. We might get into it later in the Christmas season. But the firstborn can mean a couple things. It can be the one who's born first. Uh, just on New Year's Eve, we'll be celebrating the birth of our first grandchild. But that was 15, 16 years ago. But it can also mean firstborn in eminence or rank. And that's what it means here about Jesus. He is the highest of all ranking, of all creation. He... Uh, and for by him, in other words, the sons, all things were created by the Son in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, that is the Son, and for him, that is the Son. And he, the Son, is before all things, and in him, the Son, all things hold together. I think when I was way back in confirmation, I think I heard this verse. I was still thinking, well, if all things hold together through Jesus, the Son, in all creation, it's almost like, well, you know, like, well, what if he let go? We really don't have to worry about that, but that's just the kind of questions that start coming to our, 
12-year-old's kind of head. And I still see that whenever I see that. Don't worry, he's not going to let go, he's God. But all things hold together through the Son. Hebrews 1, we were just in Colossians, and you'll hear the same kind of things back in Hebrews. He, the Son, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe. See, the same kind of thing. Uh, in him, in the Son, all things hold together, and the writer of Hebrews says that he, the Son, upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, there's the forgiveness of sins again, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And it goes on to start saying how he's superior to the angels, and he just starts rifling off all kinds of Old Testament scriptures, backing up his argument. But we're going to go past that and go to verse 8. Because he's talking about angels and comparing them with Jesus. And it says, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, and you heard me right. Of the Son, God the Father says, your throne, O God. God the Father is speaking to God the Son and calling him God and saying, your throne is forever. You take away the mystery, you can try to make human sense out of it. But then you have false teaching and heresy. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And that dominion of Jesus, the rule of Jesus, and so on, it, 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 the fantastic thing is going to be forever and ever. <laughs> what we do in our society is we have elections. That no matter what it seems, whoever is elected, there is buyer's remorse. And then they have the next elections a couple years later. Then usually people try to vote out the person who's in. And then they try to vote someone else in, and then two years later, they're trying to vote them out again. So there's two things. One is we never have anyone that everyone's satisfied, satisfied with. And second of all, their rule is short-lived. But God's rule is perfect through God the Son. It will be forever and ever, and it will always be satisfying. Two more passages I just want to devotionally take you through. One is uh, Daniel chapter 7 to look at. We'll come back to Hebrews chapter 1 and look at that, some other words there. And then we're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Well, in Daniel chapter 7, and we have been reading some of this. These scriptures have come up in the, in the readings. But it talks, it says in verse 9, As I looked, Daniel saw this in a vision. He said, thrones were placed and the Ancient of Days, and of course, that is very clear. That's God the Father, God Almighty, the Ancient of Days. He took his seat on his throne, and his clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head were like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. And a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. Thousand, thousands served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him, and the court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Then it goes through what happens at the judgment, and you, you hear these words about the beast, the beast in Revelation, the beast here in Daniel. They're always human beings that are despicable, warmongers, uh, who just go out to, for their power and just mow people down, especially the people of God. But in Daniel, it says this is what's going to happen. They're going to be killed. They're going to be destroyed. They're going to be burned with fire. And dominion from them, their rule is going to be taken away. And then it goes on again in this vision. And behold, with the clouds of heaven... There came one like a son of man. In other words, one who looked like a human being. That's what you got when you had that fire with Daniel's three guys. One like a son of man, like a human being. And he came to the Ancient of Days. In other words, God the Father on the throne. 
and was presented before him. And to him, that is, what the one like the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. And that's what we have to look forward to. That's why we get excited about the return of Jesus. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So back to Hebrews. Remember it said, of the Son, God the Father says, your throne, O God. Well, verse 9 he continues. He says, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. Speaking of the earth and the heavens, they will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. If that's all we had, it would be pretty scary to think that all of a sudden, the judgment will come, the heavens and the earth and creation will just be burned up in this horrible fire. What happens to us? But Peter says in his second letter, chapter 3, he says, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire. Same message. Being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. In verse 10 he says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So Peter makes a conclusion here. And he says in verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? How should that affect our lives and how we live? Well, he's saying we ought to live holy lives in godliness as we wait for the and hasten the coming of the day of the God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But here's the good news, verse 13. But according to his promise, he has promised us, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We look forward to the return of Christ, we look forward to a new heavens and a new earth. And in John chapter 1, I leave you with this uh, thought as, as we continue. Uh, John said, Jesus, he came to his own. In other words, he was Jewish. He was by birth and by citizenship of the kingdom of Israel, but he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But it says, but to those who did receive him, and remember, there was a remnant, a group of his people that did receive him. To those he gave the right to become children of God, and he gives us that right too. By receiving Christ, we have the right to become children of God, children of the new heavens and the new earth and his kingdom. So, Lord, we pray that we take your word and you'd, you'd make us excited. Lord, help us every time we see an Advent candle lit, realize that time is being rolled up like a scroll. But it's wonderful because it's bringing us one week every week closer for your return and the new heavens and the new earth that you have made for us and for you to dwell together forever. 
Lord, give us faith in all that you've done for us and give us excitement as we see all the things in the world pointing to your return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we continue on page 249 with the prayers. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. And Father, we pray for all those in, in spiritual authority. We, we pray for our district president, Kevin Wilson, all the presidents and leaders in our synodical president, and we pray for all pastors in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all the people. Let us pray to the Lord. For President Biden, for all public servants and for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this every place, let us pray to the Lord. For those who bring offerings and those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. And Lord, we pause for a moment to pour out the needs of our hearts before you. For all these needs that have been mentioned and taken to the throne of God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Alleluia. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord, to you, O Lord. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand with me. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
bless and preserve you. Amen. And we sing verses 4 through 6 of hymn 357. Thank you. 